with all that being said, it sounds like Danny, the room has decided that the floor is yours. So, um, uh, Kelsey, really phenomenal job. Um, round of applause for Mr. Danny Shelton. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you. Um, so I know that this is uh, a quite of a lot of a heavy topic for um, for tonight. Uh, three big talks right in a row. We had a talk on climate change about um, three weeks ago. Uh, Danny came up to me afterwards and he let me know that this is actually his field. He is an expert um, in this, and he wanted to. I don't want to set the stage too high for you. I'm sorry, <laughs> but um, but he's been struggling pretty damn hard to condense down the most important bits into uh, a 15 minute slot, um, and it seems like he's been able to do it. So so um, one more round of applause, Mr. Danny Shelton. Thank you so much. Danny. Okay, great. Okay, hi guys. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about climate change, but I'm going to focus on two things in particular. How do we know what we know, and what are we going to do about it? Um, so you may have heard uh, about two months ago now, the United Nations released a report saying that we've got just 12 years to avoid uh, climate catastrophe. Um, that was widely reported as the end of the world. It's worth st uh, starting with, even though pretty much everyone now accepts that the climate is changing, um, some people are still not sure about whether or not it's us that are causing it. Um, is it really going to be as bad as they say it's going to be? And maybe it's just a blip. Maybe it's just going to uh, bounce back pretty quickly. So who's giving us the information? Well, the IPCC have been around for 30 years. Their mission statement is to collect every bit of information that's available and to come up with realistic response strategies. Thousands of scientists from all over the world contribute to this work. The last report that came out was based on more than 6,000 different scientific papers. To try and give you uh, like an idea of how much work goes into that, one scientific paper will take a team of experts, usually a year at least, sometimes several years, just to produce one. So what I'm trying to get at is that we should give credit where credit is due to the concentration of uh, scientific expertise that is here. We should really be listening to these guys. Please have a look at the website because you don't have to have a background in science to understand it. It's really accessible. You can find out more about what's going on. So how do they know what they know? Well, the last 800,000 years is easy because that's on record. We've got ice cores. You can analyze the little air bubbles in there. They tell us about the uh, atmospheric composition. We know about the CO2 levels and about the air temperature. That's kind of easy. It gives us graphs like this. So you can see straight away how close the relationship is between temperature, um, CO2, and sea levels. This is just the last 400,000 years. A couple of things to, to note. One is the, the amplitude, how much change happens. So the global average temperature has changed by 6 degrees in the last 400,000 years. That's quite a lot. Um, the other one, which is even more astonishing, is the sea level rise or change rather, sorry. So we've seen more than 100 meters of change in the last 400,000 years. At the height of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, the sea level was more than 100 meters lower than it is today. And that's difficult for us to get our heads around. The thing that I want you to try and take away from this is just how much change happens naturally within our system. Okay, so that sounds like a long time, but actually the world is so much vastly older than 800,000 years. And if we're gonna understand what's happening now, we have to understand what happened before. So. Uh, this is the geological record. This is four and a half billion years of our planet's history. And the way to read this uh, graph is you, st you stack it like a tower. So you start with the Precambrian, and then you move through the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. The black and white lines, just for interest, are every time that the North and South Pole have flipped magnetic um, polarity. The last 800,000 years that I was just talking about that we've got on record represents roughly that amount of time. So we're starting to get a, a sense for just how long this planet has been spinning around for. So when the direct record t runs out, where do we turn? Where do we get our information from? And there's this great um, branch of science called paleoclimatology, and it aims to do just that. All of the information in paleoclimatology is based on what we call proxy data. And what I mean by that is there's no more direct records to, to turn to, so you have to look for signals from other places that tell you indirectly what the, what the climate was doing. I'd like to talk to you about these, but I haven't got time. The, the important thing to note is that there are many different sources of information. They, uh, they're taken from all over the different parts of the world, and the most important thing is they're all worked out using very different methodologies. Uh, 
So when you have one set of data alone, it's not enough to feel confident about what the climate was doing. But when you start putting them all on top of each other and they start to agree with each other about what the climate was doing, then we can start to have a quite a comprehensive picture of what was going on and have some confidence. And we end up with something like this. So this is a temperature and CO2 graph for the last 570 million years. When you start trying, trying to go further back than that, you're really scraping the barrel for any sort of signals at all. A couple of things to note, the quickest changes that we've ever ha had happen on this planet have taken place over a period of tens of millions of years. The biggest extinction event that ever happened was the, pre the Permian-Triassic extinction event, where nearly 96% of all life on the planet went extinct. That happened over a period of 10,000 years. So we don't know what caused that climate change to happen, but we do know that the warming of the oceans so rapidly led to deoxygenation and essentially like a starving of the oceans. One of the things to note is that throughout much of geological time, um, temperature has actually preceded changes in CO2. So we're so used to hearing about CO2 driving climate change that it's kind of hard to imagine that it wouldn't be the case. But through large parts of the history, you can see how um, temperature has kind of dipped and then peaked again, and CO2 has kind of followed it afterwards. So if it's not always CO2 driving that change, then what is it? Um, other natural changes would be extraterrestrial impacts like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, volcanic activity, the Deacon Traps is the biggest um, volcanic structure in the world. So for 30,000 years, there was uh, an area the size of a uh, part of India that was uh, erupting. Another one is tectonic configurations. So this is really important because it determines how the thermohaline circulation, the ocean currents work. And this is a really critical factor for how heat is transported from the equatorial regions up and down to the, the poles. And we know in the past that this has shut down. That was um, a big factor of the Permian extinction. This is one of the potential feedback loops that we're running a risk of, and we really don't want this to happen. Um, but a big change, a, a big factor is how much sunlight we receive. And we tend to think of this as being uh, set, but it's not. And the reason is because our planet, just like all orbiting bodies, doesn't orbit in a perfect circle. And we've got three different uh, types of what we call orbital perturbations or irregularity. So the eccentricity, how elliptical the orbit is, the tilt of the planet changes, and then the wobble of that tilt as well. And they're all on different um, cycles, but they're completely predictable. So it's just like the phases of the moon. You can look back in the past and you can go into the future and you know what they're going to be doing. Every so often, these cycles overlap and they create the conditions that are perfect for either wintertime ice building or summertime ice melting. So you've got the three different uh, signals uh, shown there and then the combination of them. And you can see how this peaked at about the same time as the Ermine warm period began. So this is an in interglacial period, like a warm period like we're in now. So we think that this is a critical mechanism for how this happens. Okay, so we know what happened in the past. We know what we're doing now. Um, how do we know what's going to happen in the future? At the moment, we use computer models. Now, straight away, I'm going to say we know that the computer models are not perfect. The atmosphere is a highly complex three-dimensional system. Uh, cloud formation is incredibly difficult to predict, and we're talking about 100-year scales for, for predictions. Um, a model is only as good as the assumptions it's based upon and the, the data that you feed it. But I put it to you like this. How much certainty do we need? When you run hundreds of different models, each with a slightly different assumption, you get this kind of like range of probabilities. And maybe one says you're on track for seven degrees of warming. Maybe one says you're on track for less than one. But most of them are saying about three degrees. So this is where we think we're heading at the moment unless we change something about three degrees of warming. If you were unlucky enough to have a doctor turn to you and say that uh, you're very ill and you've got 12 days to do something about it, and if you don't do something about it, you're going to be either severely affected or badly affected. You're probably not going to say, do you know what, I'll wait for the 3% of certainty to find out just how bad it's going to be. You're probably going to do something about it straight away. Uh, so where are we today? Today we're at 405 parts per million. It's a tiny bit of the atmosphere, but we know that small quantities of compounds can have large effects on complex systems. Uh, we started at 280 parts per million before we started uh, burning stuff in large quantities. The last time that CO2 was as high as it is today was three million years ago. Three million years ago, we didn't exist. Three million years ago, the sea level was 25 meters higher than it is today. And I'm trying to get across to you a sense of the lag, the, the um, delay that there is in the system uh, for catching it up. So we cannot exceed 450 parts per million. We think that at that point, we'll go to 1.5 degrees of warming. And at that point, we run the risk of feedback loops. That is something we want to avoid at all costs. A feedback loop by its nature, it doesn't matter how much CO2 is in the atmosphere once one begins, because it's self-sustaining. So you can start pulling it out. Once one's begun, it's kind of too late to do anything about it. 
So how big a challenge are we talking about? I'm not going to lie, guys, this is huge. So in order to achieve this goal of keeping it below 1.5, we need to half our current global output of carbon emissions within 12 years. And that is massive. Leaders from uh, all the different world governments are meeting right now as we speak in Poland to work out how we're going to try and um, put into uh, effect mechanisms to deal with this. Um, a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Nationalism and populism, populism seem to rear their ugly heads just at the time when we really need unprecedented levels of international cooperation. And that's bad news for us. We seem to have a collection of the worst world leaders in living memory, it seems, at the moment. Another big barrier, I think, and this is something that has affected me personally throughout my whole time of engaging with this topic, is this feeling of disempowerment from being like a drop in the ocean. I think it's really worth kind of calling this out, that there's a dichotomy, that two things are true at the same time, and they're not mutually exclusive. On one hand, many people doing lots of little things does make a big difference. It really does. At the same time, any one individual's carbon footprint isn't going to change whether or not climate change happens. But rather than kind of feeling defeated by that, I think it's important to just like acknowledge it, embrace it, and kind of move on from that point. Uh, techno-optimism, very quickly. Techno-optimists say, don't worry about it, we'll come up with inventions and it'll all be fine. Clearly, some inventions are going to be part of the solution. They have to be. Hydrogen cars, I think, are going to take longer than we need them to because the infrastructure just isn't there. Fourth generation biofuels might be something a bit more promising because it can go into the existing uh, transport systems that we have. But technical solutions are not the only answer. We have to have systemic changes as well. Um, oh sorry, I meant to say very quickly, uh, solar panel uh, deployment is going quicker than anyone expected. That's really good news. And renewables in general are going quicker than we expected, but we have to keep that up. Uh, climate change is ultimately just a symptom of a bigger problem, which is this like myopic obsession with the growth imperative. And it seems to have been adopted by every government in the world. Kennedy Balding put it so very well when he said, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either madman or an economist. And it's so very true. So, personal actions, what can we do? And the first thing that I would advocate is try to decouple yourself from planned obsolescence. What I mean by that as an example is if you've got an iPhone in your pocket right now and it's like the second, the third, the fourth or the fifth iPhone that you own, Apple have got you. They've got you by the balls. Try, if you can, to remove yourself from any sort of business plan that requires you to uh, replace a high-energy item like a smartphone every year or two years. It's, it's not sustainable. Seek out different business models. They do exist. There are independent startups that try to buck the trend, but they need our support in order to make them viable. A good example is uh, Fairphone. This, this is a Dutch startup company. It's been around for about six years. I bought one of their phones a couple of years ago because it's modular. So the whole idea is if you break the screen or you need to you know, replace a battery or the CPU, you just order the part from the company, you put it in yourself, you don't need any tools, it's like a Lego brick. Um, try and find these ones. Bring the waste hierarchy to the forefront of your mind. Everyone is familiar with this, reduce, reuse and recycle. Try and make it your personal mantra. So every single time that you buy a product or you're considering a service or even just using the aircon, just think about, do I need as much as what I was considering of getting? Um, Big one, big, big one. The easiest, most significant way that anyone can cut their uh, personal footprint is eat less meat. Even better than that is go vegetarian. Even better than that is go vegan. If you're going to continue to eat meat, that's absolutely your choice. Be aware that lamb and beef are absolutely the worst offenders. Next is pork and then chicken and fish. If you can, cut them out. Make them a, a special treat. I'm acutely aware with this one, of fly less that I'm sitting in a room full of people, like myself included, that probably have wanderlust and want to see the world as much as possible and go to many different places. It's an uncomfortable and inconvenient truth that we have to fly less. There, just, there isn't, unfortunately, any kind of technical fix for this in the pipeline even. If you think about how much energy is needed to propel that massive object through the air at 500 miles an hour, it's so energy intensive, we have to fly less. It's, it, that's all there is to that. Other personal actions, ethical finance. This is something that I think doesn't get a lot of coverage, but I'm talking about mortgages, pensions, loans, and savings accounts. Maybe you're thinking, I don't have any of those yet. Maybe you don't, maybe you've got some of them, but you probably have some of them at least in the next coming years. When you do start looking at getting some of those, please be aware that extractive industries are funded in part by all of us. 
I'll give you an example. Barclays is a massive high street bank in the in the UK. They've got 30,000 of their customers at the moment signing a petition saying they're going to leave because they fund tar sands directly. So please be aware that when you're putting your money into one of these financial institutions, they don't just sit on it, they lend it to other people as well. And often that's been used for these extractive industries. Use a bank that has an ethical investment policy. It means that they're not going to use your money for anything like um, extractive industries or weapons or tobacco or anything nasty like that. Try to invest in green technology and initiatives. Um, green stocks and shares perform well and are, are low risk. So there are other platforms, but check out Ethics. It's a website where you can look at all sorts of different um, initiatives. They're all financially regulated. They give you good returns on your investment, and the money has been used to do good things. Um, one that I've got shares in myself and had the absolute pleasure of being involved with uh, was Plymouth Energy Community. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this is because I know that there are other uh, businesses that use this model throughout the world. This is essentially like, um, like a crowdfunding scheme. So uh, residents and other investors buy shares. The money gets used to buy solar panels. We put it on uh, community buildings and build arrays. Uh, the money from the power sales come back to investors along with um, uh, feed-in tariffs, so subsidies paid by government. The returns come to the investors. The excess are used to support the community in like low carbon initiatives. Everyone's energy bills come down. Everyone's CO2 emissions come down. And most important of all, possibly, is that for the first time, the community own their infrastructure, the power generating infrastructure. They have direct control over it, which doesn't happen normally. Right? We have to push for system change. And a couple of things that I would really advocate for you to have on your radar. We need to keep it in the ground. This isn't about how quickly or slowly we burn stuff. There is a total limit to how much we can burn before we burst our budget. 84% of what we know is in the ground has to stay there. We cannot explore for new uh, reserves of fossil fuels. Some of the ones that we're already digging up have to be retired early. That's just a fact. There's nothing that we can do about that. We have to keep it in the ground. This is a big one. One, one of the biggest criticisms about uh, renewable energy is that it's not financially viable without subsidies from government. And that is true to a certain extent, but it is changing. Something that people don't seem to be aware of is that we're subsidizing fossil fuels that have been around for a long time. The whole point of a subsidy is to help an industry get its feet on the ground. We shouldn't just continually do that. The International Monetary Fund, which is not a green organization, by the way, um, found that in 2015, the world governments combined are spending $5.3 trillion a year subsidizing fossil fuels. That's $10 million a minute. That's more than we spend on healthcare combined. This is insane. So this isn't a case that we don't have the money, we don't have the resources. It's just about where we choose to put it. So we have to make this um, a, a policy priority. We have to make large-scale interventions by governments not just possible but demanded for by us as citizens. Um, unpopular interventions like carbon tax and rationing of flights, they're going to come. Okay, they have to come. And when they do, we need to support them. Rather than kind of going kicking and screaming, I don't want that carbon tax, we have to actually put our weight behind them. Okay? They can be equitable depending on how they're done. Okay, very quickly, I want to tell you um, about a group of people that became known as the King's North Six. So in the UK in 2006, the UK government was proposing to build a new coal-fired power station. The following year, six Greenpeace activists broke into that power station and they spent 12 hours climbing a 250-metre chimney with a whole load of equipment. When they got to the top, they abseiled off the side and they painted Gordon in big white letters. Gordon was the name of our Prime Minister at the time. Um, they shut it down and they were arrested. They were taken to court, liable for damages of $40,000. Now, I just want to say these were not six full-time crusty hippies. They were normal people with jobs and lots to, li uh, to, to lose. And they put their um, liberty on the line for something that they believed in. This is like the best possible outcome of a direct action. They were acquitted on the basis that their actions were justifiable because they were trying to prevent more damage being caused to other property around the world. This is the whole purpose of direct action. It's not just to shut something down for a little while or piss people off by closing roads or even to get on the news, although that, that is part of the goal. The main goal is to do something which is arrestable, to go before a judge and to have your actions found justifiable because it changes policy. Now, neither the UK government nor E.ON, which is a company that owned this uh, power station, are willing to admit it. But strangely enough, they scrapped that coal power station that they were proposing and they knocked down this one when it came to the end of its life. So direct actions can have big changes. So the last thing that I would advocate to you is please consider taking part in civil disobedience. And now I'm not suggesting that we all go and start protesting here in Hanoi. Climate change is a, a global problem, but it's in a national framework. It's 
the responsibility of each of us from wherever, whichever country we're from to hold our uh, politicians to account. Protest movements have a rich history of affecting large-scale change. And this isn't about economics or finance. It's about politics, ultimately. It's about political will. We find some non-violent direct action training. Uh, it might be difficult to find in Hanoi, but look out for it. Um, you can do a good course in a weekend. It's, no, it's always free. It will teach you about the principles of how this is done. The UN's report uh, two months ago was a call to action, and I really, really hope that all of us hear that call to action. Please watch carefully. Think about when and where you can have the most effect. Choose your moment, and when you see it, take courage. Thank you so much for listening. Yes. Appreciate it. Woo!